Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. I have a story of unintended consequences. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission is looking to ban gas stoves. These are stoves that use natural gas to cook our food. Think through the unintended consequences here. To cook with natural gas, your stove burns natural gas, which cooks your food, and you're done. What happens when natural gas stoves are banned? People will switch to, likely, electric stoves. But to cook with electricity, a power plant burns natural gas to create steam. The steam powers a turbine. The turbine generates electricity. The electricity is sent across miles of power lines where it is stepped down from 11,000 volts to the 220 volts that enters your electric stove and heats an element that cooks your food. At each step of that process, precious energy is lost to inefficiencies. In total, around 60% or more of the energy used in electrical power plants is lost. So requiring homeowners to cook with electricity instead of natural gas will have the unintended consequence of tripling the amount of power required to run their stoves. This is the same kind of foolishness that we end up explaining to people who point so proudly at their electric vehicles and say, see, I'm not using gas. Right. You mean they're coal powered vehicles. (laughs) That's right. It's just coal powered in a place where you can't see it. People may come back with the rejoinder, yeah, but how many people cook with natural gas to begin with? Turns out 40% of us cook with natural gas. And you might come back with another response, which is how much electricity is generated with natural gas. Maybe we use other things. It turns out that about 40% of our electricity is generated by natural gas. And they're not going to care about the generation of electricity because the pretext that they're using here to regulate yet another avenue of our behavior is that it's releasing some kind of particulates into the home that are poisoning us slowly but surely. Now, I don't see any good reason why we can't have, instead of no gas stoves, better hoods above those gas stoves to vent the stuff outside. And it would take far less electricity to run the fan on a hood that vents the natural gas fumes than it would to use the electricity to generate the heat to cook the food. I don't have much tolerance for government attempting to save me from myself, but if you want to make an environmental argument here that we want to somehow move away from fossil fuels, because if the stoves are all electric, put aside for the moment that most of our electricity comes from natural gas and coal, that we can produce electricity through renewables. Except hang on. We don't have nearly the amount of renewables. I mean, like orders of magnitude, we don't have the capacity of renewables to generate the electricity we need. What we would have had if it hadn't been for the environmentalists is nuclear power, which is completely carbon free. If they were serious, they would have been chasing the best possible answer, not the pie in the sky answer that they wish were possible. I mean, what are they going to do? They're going to come and yank my oven out of my house? Oh, no, they're just not going to sell any new ones, so you're going to find it harder and harder to get replacement parts for the thing. Of course, on the other side, the value of your stove in resale markets may skyrocket because nobody's producing them anymore. Here we go, right? And I'm going to have to buy three new stoves and leave them in the garage (laughs) for future problems as they come. And look, I wouldn't be so intransigent if I didn't know that the minute they get their way on this, they're going to look and say, what can we ban next? I would be much more open to their thoughts of banning things if they considered the unintended consequences. But it seems that all they see is, I'm going to pass this law and everyone is going to behave exactly like I imagine they'll behave. How often has that worked over the course of human history? About zero times. How on earth was this not the foolishness of the week? (laughs) Right. But hold my beer, Ant, because I have an interesting story here, too. The University of Michigan pays more than $18 million a year to diversity, equity, and inclusion staff. How much inclusion do you think they can buy for $18 million a year? Because everybody who's ever looked into this concludes that the answer is almost none. They have no effect. The only real difference that any of them make is that they employ people who may meet the diversity requirements. It's the employees themselves. That is correct. And our old friend and former guest on Words and Numbers, Mark Perry, has carved into these people in a recent Daily Caller article. 
They pay $18 million to support 142 staff members. Good God, 142? You could staff a small college for that. How many full tuition scholarships could you give for $18 million? And which is worth more? These sorts of programs or free college scholarships? Free college scholarships for minorities. If you want diversity, hand them out that way. At $18 million a year, let's figure on the high end, room, board, tuition, fees, the whole business at, uh, let's say, $40,000, which is probably high for a state school. But nonetheless, we're talking like 450 scholarships. You give out almost 500 complete full ride room, board, tuition scholarships for that amount of money. And you could do it every single year. That's the crime of it all, right? Because you could do something that made a significant difference in a lot of lives. Yeah. But instead, these people would rather look like they're doing a good thing. And that sounds an awful lot like my story of banning the natural gas stoves. It certainly looks like you're doing a good thing until you stop and think the whole thing through. In December 2021, Perry tweeted that the Ohio State University employed 132 DEI-focused staff during the 2021-22 academic year. That number of staff cost $13.4 million which could cover the cost of in-state tuition for 1,120 students. Wow, 1,120. All right, so my figures were very conservative. And I want to point out, Ant, that not only was your story not the foolishness of the week, but this was But your story isn't either. (laughs) So what's the foolishness of the week? (laughs) And here we end up with three separate things, each of which would have been perfectly fine as the foolishness of the week. We're back to the 1619 Project, that thing that's been debunked except Hulu is apparently taking it seriously because the 1619 Project is going to be released as a Hulu docuseries. There's some serious academic question about the 1619 Project. No, there's not. A serious question would mean that there were arguments to be made on both sides. Can you summarize for our listeners the 1619 Project? It begins with the assertion that American history begins properly in 1619 when the first slave stepped off the first boat onto American soil. Why? Why not 1776? Why not 1787? Two dates that people should know something about. If you think race plays a pivotal role, why not 1860? Something that I've just started working on in my capacity as senior editor at AIER is what's going to be called the 1865 Project, which has the humble assertion that if you really want to date something important in the United States in and around the problem of race, and let's be clear, we have had and maybe continue to have, although clearly not to the same degree, a race problem in the United States. 1865 is the year you really want to consider because that was the year that the last slave was freed. And how is that not more important than the day the first slave got here? In human history, slavery was the norm. There were multiple kinds of slavery, and chattel slavery, as we had it here in the United States, was not the typical kind of slavery that we looked around the world and found. But when we did look around the world throughout human history, we found one form of slavery after another Mm -hmm. until roughly the middle of the 19th century. When Abraham Lincoln said four score and seven years ago, he dated the founding of America with the Declaration of Independence. And from that day to the day that Lincoln gave his Gettysburg Address, 87 years had passed, and we went from having slavery as the norm to well on its way to extinction. That's the story of the United States. Is it perfect? Was it perfectly founded? Was everything here perfectly just? The answer to all of those questions is no. And yet, 87 years later, slavery was gone. That you go from having it be the de facto position of the human race, that this is how we behave, to saying, not only is this not how we behave, we're never going to behave this way. It's fundamentally unjust to behave this way. And we're moving forward with a much better way of seeing the world. And if you really want to understand what role the United States played in slavery on a global level, you have to understand that it was absolutely pivotal in its annihilation. For one-stop shopping for all things James and Ant, visit our website, wordsandnumbers.org. If you're a full-time college student looking for something educational, fun, and free, 
applied to join me and James and several faculty who have appeared on Words and Numbers at the inaugural summer seminar on the theory and practice of classical liberalism. The week-long seminar is hosted by the Stevenson Institute at Wabash University and will be held June 5th through the 10th. There's no charge and meals and lodging are provided. To apply, see the link in the show notes. I got an email today from our friend Larry Lagerberg. I think Larry is the first person ever to come and see us on the road. We speak at places and the people we meet at the place are all attached to the place. But one day we were at a high school in Denver and I looked up and there was a man who was far too old to be in high school. (laughs) And I said, who the hell are you? And he said, I'm Larry Lagerberg. Don't you recognize me? I said, well, I do now. The name is so familiar. We've been dealing with Larry for a while by the time we met him. But I do think he was the very first person ever to make a special trip when he found out we were going to be somewhere to come out and see us. And I thought it was really unbelievable that somebody would want to do such a thing. I'm always astonished that people would want to take the time, and I appreciate every last one of them. Here's what Larry wants to know. He says, hi, gents. Is there any legitimate reason the federal government doesn't do a full accounting of its unfunded liabilities? Yes, there's a good reason for that. So just for background, unfunded liabilities is the term that's given to money that the federal government has promised to pay people, which it does not have the money to pay. The reason we call them liabilities instead of debt is that the government is not legally obligated to pay it. What we're dancing around here, of course, is Social Security. Every year, the government will send you a piece of paper in the mail saying, here's our record of how much you've earned since you've been working. And according to these calculations, if life continues in the future as it has in the past, when you retire at age 67 or whatever it is, you will receive the following amount of money each month as your Social Security retirement benefit. That document is not legally binding. That's a bunch of hot nonsense is what it is. Now, the weird thing is, if a private company sent a letter like that and then didn't pay you... Oh, they'd be sued into oblivion. Exactly. There'd be class action lawsuits all over the place here. But the federal government does this, and the fact is they are not required, and this comes from the Supreme Court long ago. Nestor V. Fleming, as I recall. Yeah, said quite clearly that Social Security retirement benefits are not an asset. They are not the right of the retiree. They're simply a grant by Congress. And people say the same nonsense all the time. I paid my money in and they owe it to me. Well, no, that's not how this works. The whole question becomes more complicated here because on the one hand, while legally the government is not required to pay this money, we can't just wash our hands of it and say, oh, okay, then Social Security really should not be counted as a debt. The fact is, most Americans, I would guess, expect that this money is coming in. And that's not an unreasonable expectation. If you ask the average American, are you aware that the federal government actually doesn't owe you this money and could not pay you? They'd lose their minds. People are expecting (laughs) this. And because they're expecting it, they're making plans. Politicians are constantly complaining about the low savings rate in this country. The fact is we have a low savings rate in part because they keep telling people that they have this pension called Social Security. Let's call it what it is. They steal 12 and a half percent of my salary. If they didn't take it, I would get to do what I wanted with it, which would be, you know, savings. The federal debt right now is 30 plus trillion dollars. When you add in the unfunded liabilities, it's 130 trillion dollars. Or is it $230 trillion? The low estimate is $100 trillion. This goes to Larry's question of why isn't the government more forthcoming about what these unfunded liabilities are. Part of the problem is they are very difficult to calculate because you've got to estimate what the future population is going to look like. So we're going to have population growth, what rate, at what age will people be retiring, how long will they live, you know, so life expectancy, of course, that varies by age and gender and race. What's inflation? What are the interest rates? All sorts of things you've got to take into account. And so, as you say, the margin of error here is like $100 trillion. And put that in perspective. <laughs> that's the GDP of the entire planet. 
a hundred trillion dollars, right? <laughs> That's the margin of error we're talking about. The margin of error is three times our massive federal debt. <laughs> yeah. So what we do know is that on the low end, people have estimated, I say people, economists have estimated that the unfunded liabilities are about a hundred trillion dollars. Now, here's what that means. The federal government would have to have on hand, in cash, today, $100 trillion, the principal and interest from which would make up for the shortfall it's expected to have going into the future because it's going to be paying out more in Social Security benefits than it's going to be receiving in payroll taxes. And this is where people have said to me, well, none of this really means anything because Congress can change the rules at any time. And of course it can. And that's exactly what's going to happen. And this is Social Security Administration will tell you this. Congress within the next 10 to 15 years is going to have to either increase payroll taxes by around 20 to 25 percent or cut Social Security benefits by around 20 to 25 percent or some combination of the two. It's a combination of the two, and don't forget the magic sauce, Ant. Oh, yeah. They're going to inflate it away. Yeah, the magic sauce is the Federal Reserve just kind of prints the money, but then you pay in inflation. So no matter how you cut it, you got to pay for this. That's right. Either the people who were supposed to receive it are going to receive less than they were expecting, or the people who are paying into it are going to have to pay more than they had anticipated, or we're all going to pay more for everything because of inflation. And it's going to be all three of those things. Yeah, I tend to think so. You and I have been saying Social Security just needs to end. This is ridiculous. It's a Ponzi scheme and all of that, all of which is true. But the closer I get to retirement, the more I keep thinking, well, you know, Social Security should probably keep going. (laughs) Maybe maybe we could just keep right on going, kick that can down the road. Yeah, but see, that's where the incentives lie. Most people paying into it have an incentive to end it. The people who have an incentive to keep it going, those are the elderly who are drawing benefits. And you know what? That's also the group that tends to get out in big numbers and vote. I want to say something nice about Larry after he asked a question that really makes my stomach hurt. One hell of a saxophone player. I'm always astonished at the talents, the people who join us on this road every week. I'm shocked at the things that they can do. And Larry is one hell of a saxophone player. Drew Dameron asks a fascinating question. He wants to know the difference between rights and privileges. Is voting a right or a privilege? Should we be able to lose rights? And that opens up a whole can of interesting questions about political rights versus constitutional rights versus natural rights. That last part that you just dashed off is the important. Is voting a right? Yeah, it can be within the context of a given system. So you call it a constitutional right? It's a political right. A political right, yeah. You don't wake up prior to government with a right to vote. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to have a democratic republic of some kind, voting is absolutely required. Is it a right? Well, yeah, kind of. But is it like the right to life? No, it's not like that at all. Yeah, it's not something you're born with by virtue of you being human. That's right. You start to think about it in those terms, and I think it comes into a pretty clear focus. Whenever you talk about rights, you're going to be into the mud pretty quickly. These things are going to be very contentious. People will say that your having a right doesn't mean I have fewer rights. Well, of course it does. If we're dealing with rights in context where necessarily we all have to live together and that's difficult and you have to give a little to get a little... The idea of absolute rights just doesn't take on the kind of shine that you wish it would. Now, it does under certain circumstances, and you can make the case, I think, very clearly when you say I have the right to life, which means you have no right to kill me. That seems so foundational to everything else. I want to push back there because my question to you was going to be, how do you deal with someone who would question whether natural rights exist at all? You're claiming you have a right to life, but if I'm bigger than you, I can argue otherwise. What makes you right? Well, there are people like this. The bulwark that we have in place against them is that the vast majority of us can agree on very simple premises. We can't agree on very complicated ones or even marginally complicated ones, but very, very simple ones. Yeah, we can agree on those. Like, you have no right to kill me. Anybody who would intrude upon that 
gets violence visited upon him, and I'm fine with that. Every reasonable person is fine with that. There comes a point where you have to realize that rights do, in fact, have to be defended from time to time. And as a matter of fact, they have to be defended way more often than any of us would like. So is this what Jefferson meant when he said self-evident? In effect, natural rights are self-evident. A self-evident truth is just one that, and I use this example, it's not exactly right, but it's plenty close enough. The truth of the conclusion is contained within the premises. If you know what the words all and men and created are, if you know what those three words mean, literally the only answer you can come to is equal. You can't come to some different answer. That's what a self-evident truth is. It's not one that's really simple, although that's what everybody thinks it means. It's that the truth of the conclusion is contained within the premises. The confusion comes when a bunch of people want to become defense attorneys and decide that they can strip you of your rights by their clever language. So we have natural rights, which are rights accorded you by virtue of you being human. By virtue of your shared humanity. We all have them. They're all the same. It's because we're all equally human. We have political rights, which are rights that we agree that we have. And even if we don't, they're dependent upon the political system. And then we have privileges. People say driving is a privilege. That's nonsense. Would privilege be, quote unquote, right bestowed by government? Now you're going to end up splitting hairs indefinitely. This happens every time. And who wants to make this big distinction between rights and privileges? People who would like to exercise authority over you. Hmm. That's who wants to do that. Right. Do I have a right to drive? I don't know. Can I afford the car? Because it seems if I can afford the car, I have the right to drive. Why do I have to be licensed to do something that the license actually brings nothing to the table? People say all the time that we have licenses to make sure that bad drivers are not on the roads. Well, a hell of a great job that's been doing all these years. (laughs) Right. I mean, that's just nonsense, pure and simple, right? That's not how it works. It's a measure of control that the government uses to keep its people in line. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, If government decides that you're not going to be able to drive, what the hell are you going to be able to do? Are you going to be able to make a living? Probably not. Are you going to be able to live independently? No. Look at all the dominoes that fall because they decide to rescind a privilege. Well, what gave them the right to rescind a privilege in the first place? Indeed, what gave government the right to declare a privilege in the first place? And this is, I think, where we go wrong with the language of privilege The language of privilege makes perfect sense in families, for example. It makes perfect sense in friend groups, places that are generally voluntary or that are organized in such a way to answer the problems of minor children. Okay, now it makes a lot of sense. It doesn't make a lick of sense when you're talking about free and independent adults when it comes to the point where the government decides who may drive. Who the hell gave government that level of responsibility in the first place? And who among us would think that it would be exercised well? And therein always lies the problem with privilege. We always end up talking about driver's licenses, but it could be almost anything that requires a license. You and I have had some famous disagreements about licensure, where I say crazy things like, I'm really okay with neurosurgeons needing to be licensed, right? Mm -hmm. In a way that I don't think it's all that necessary that plumbers be so, or God help me, hair braiders, or people who want to do nails, right? right? But when it comes to cracking open a human skull, maybe different rules apply. I don't want to get too far into the weeds on that, because there is obviously so much that we can deal with where we would all be in rabid agreement. Let's deal with that first before we get all the way down the road where we don't know what to do with the details of an example. Rights are an issue no matter what. Privileges, I think, are always better left out of the political realm. Following on the conversation of rights, Mark Rosenthal Ayers asks, after hearing James talk about the original case, I've been wondering what would the following dominoes look like if the Supreme Court were to overturn or rein in Wickard v. Filburn? Yeah, it's fun to think about that, isn't it? And then you realize that why on earth would the federal government ever divest the federal government of the federal government's power? Right. Now, for background, Wickard v. Filburn is the case that weaponized the Commerce Clause. Well, yeah, interstate commerce is 
the purview of the federal government. The federal government can regulate interstate commerce. In this one case, we had a farmer growing, whether it was corn or wheat, I can't remember, on his own property, which was in the confines of one state. He wasn't even going to bring it to market. He was going to feed it to his own farm animals. And the federal government came in in the name of interstate commerce and said, you can't do that. Well, any rational person would say, why not? It's not interstate commerce. It's not even commerce. He's feeding it to his animals. That's right. But of course, the federal government begs to disagree, and the federal government disagrees thusly. If you didn't grow this stuff on your own land for your own farm animals, then you would have bought it on the open market. And if you bought it on the open market, Well, interstate commerce would have been implicated then, so it's interstate commerce. Because some of what you may have bought may have come across state lines. This is what you get when you give the federal government authority to do anything. It abuses that authority. I've heard many people take strict constitutionalists to task, saying that, well, you can't read the document exactly as it's stated. They use this term, living document. Why not? The words are right there on the page. They all have clear definitions. And the minute you stop reading the words that are on the page, you get nonsense like this, where all of a sudden the clear words mean whatever the reader wants them to mean. Well, it's not whatever the reader wants them to mean. Whatever the Supreme Court wants them to mean. Whatever the governing authority wants them to be. Yeah. And so you get the United States Congress aided and abetted by a sitting administration, in this case, the Franklin Roosevelt administration. They all decide, well, what we really need to do is read the Commerce Clause in this way, which is a way that makes no sense whatsoever. If any of the words mean anything approaching what I know them to mean, then no reasonable person should be able to engage in that line of reasoning. And yet, here we are. The real question is, what world do you want to live in? The kind in which government is restrained or the kind in which it isn't? Because those are your only two choices. To be honest to Mark's question here, he says, what would happen if the Supreme Court overturned Wickard v. Filburn? I agree with you. I don't think there's any chance it would happen. But suppose it did happen. But if it did, then you would all of a sudden have to look at a hundred other cases that were decided in equally ridiculous ways. And you'd have to say, yeah, okay, well, if we're going to live here in the real world where words have meaning... We're going to have to address every last one of these things now. The Second Amendment says the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Then why can't you carry a weapon almost anywhere? That's an infringement. Why do you need a license to carry a weapon? Also an infringement. Mm -hmm. And in many of the cases where you need a license to carry a weapon, everybody knows that it is impossible to get a license also an infringement. If the words matter, then you can't have it. I hold out no great hope that we're ever going to get past this. I think you have to draw the unfortunate conclusion that we're not exactly up to self-government. Tom Savage asks, explain the difference between statistical significance and economic significance. For example, providing health insurance has a statistically significant positive effect on physical health, but that is not a sufficient reason for having nationalized health insurance. When we talk about economic significance, we typically mean significance that's felt. Something happens and it has some tangible effect that we can all see. Statistical significance is different. It means that we're observing something that is likely not due to random chance. And we say likely because there is some probability that it is due to random chance, but if the probability is small, we say this thing is statistically significant. So here's the thing. You can have an effect that is statistically significant, yet economically insignificant. For example, if people walked an additional 100 yards every day, they would be healthier. We could measure this and find a statistical significance. We can take two large groups of people, 
10,000 people over here on the left and 10,000 people over here on the right and the 10,000 people on the left, they walk an extra 100 yards every day. And over the course of 10 years, we measure through various things, maybe their longevity, maybe their heart rates, whatever it is. And we can see statistically there is an effect here that this group that walks 100 yards a day is healthier. But there's likely not much of an economic significance or a real significance. That is, the amount of improved health is probably minuscule. So there's something that's statistically significant. Yes, it's measurable, but nobody cares. It's a small thing. Conversely, you can have things that are not statistically significant, but highly economically significant. For example, talk about the effect of the minimum wage on unemployment we can increase the minimum wage and we can observe increased unemployment. And so we say there's an economic significance here. And yet, if you apply statistics to this thing, there's so much background noise going on that you can't say definitively that what you're seeing at this particular time was due to that increase in the minimum wage. It could have been due to some other things as well or instead of. And so what you get is this difference between things that have real impact on people's lives, you can think of that as economic significance, and things that are so well measured that we can distinguish them from background noise. That's statistical significance. The layman's terminology here is it's really complicated. People incorrectly say that economics is not a science because we cannot conduct controlled studies like are done in the physical sciences. And that's correct. We can't conduct controlled studies, but that has nothing to do with whether economics is a science. The fact is we can observe things that are going on and we use statistics in an attempt to filter out the background noise. That is, we use statistics to accomplish what otherwise would be accomplished by setting controls on an experiment. We can't run the controls, so we use the statistical analysis instead. You end up with much messier answers at the end of the day than you do with a controlled experiment, but you do end up with answers. It's actually pretty impressive given that. Yeah, and that's almost always where you end up with statistics of, I'm not sure, but it looks like this. Right. There's a preponderance of the evidence that leads me to this conclusion. I see where reasonable people might disagree, but I still think I'm right. And that's really something, that you can look at complicated human things and come to understand things. Right. And that's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. We'll get even more agitated about other things next week. Until then, you can follow us on Twitter. Handles are, as always, in the show notes. You can join us on Words and Numbers Backstage, where the conversation continues. That's over on Facebook, but you already know that. And Can I say it? Go ahead. Email? Yeah, you can say it. Send us email, words and numbers podcast at gmail.com. Idiot. That's words and numbers podcast at gmail.com. Anyway, words and I numbers say, podcast at gmail.com. Can you just shut the fuck up at this point? I mean, for, for God's sake. You know, it's bad enough that you say that in a normal voice, but when you draw attention to how stupid you are by using words a stupid numbers, voice. Words and numbers podcast at gmail.com. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I woke up and I ended up looking across the way and there was Victor Lord for whatever the reason. For those of you out there, and, and we do appreciate you who have been tirelessly helping us on Patreon, well, the bonus material hasn't exactly been flowing, mostly because I've been in the hospital and on the mend, but I think I'm better enough that we can start recording bonus material again. So keep an eye out for that. Ant, until that lovely day when, again, we come together and do this and you say stupid things. Have a good week. We'll see you soon. See you next week, James. Words and Numbers Podcast at gmail.com. <laughs> Idiot.